I grew up in a small town where I rarely had to wait in line for anything. Maybe just when I went to Cedar Point, and that was fun because I got to get on the blue streak. But then I went to a large university a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away where, you may not believe this, but we didn't have computers to sign up online or register online for anything, which meant I had to wait in lines a lot. And I realized I hated waiting. What about you? How are you at waiting for things? Sometimes... Our waiting can be easy if it comes quickly or it's not very important to us. We wait, we receive, and then we move on. And we may even forget that we had to wait for it. And it's easy. But sometimes waiting is harder and it begins to wear on our emotions when what we are waiting for is more important and when the waiting goes on and on and on, Waiting can be emotionally challenging. What kind of emotions are triggered in you when you're having to wait? Impatience, frustration, anger, maybe boredom, or being sad, or or fear, or even dread? What is something that you are waiting for in your life now? And it's getting emotionally challenging. Where you may be saying to God, God, how can I cope with this waiting? We want to welcome you to worship at St. Luke. And we're so thrilled that you've come to be with us, especially if you're a guest with us today. And we are all together in our worship service. Today we're beginning the season of Advent. A little later in the service we're going to light our Advent wreath. So if you have one of those at home, you might get it out and light it with us when it comes to that part of the service. Advent is a season when we often think about waiting as the Hebrew people waited for the Messiah to come. And so this Advent, we are starting a series today on waiting. So what are you waiting for? Let's all now join together as we sing our first song today.
So sometimes waiting is easy. Sometimes waiting is emotionally challenging, but we learn to cope with it, especially if we know the time frame and the outcome for when the waiting will resolve. We say to ourselves, I don't have to wait two days or two weeks or two months or two years, and then it'll happen. And it's easier to cope. It's like the kid at Christmas. Now, it's kind of emotionally challenging for him to wait for Christmas. But when his father comes in at night and says, only three more sleeps until Christmas, it helps him to cope when it's emotionally challenging. But then there are times when waiting is the hardest. And being able to cope is significantly more challenging. Waiting is the hardest when what we are waiting for is really significant to us and we don't know the time frame or the outcome when the waiting will be resolved. This is when waiting becomes harder. And the more uncertain that waiting becomes, especially if it's something significant to us, the harder waiting is. I think during this pandemic, a lot of the waiting we've been going through is like that. We don't know when it's going to resolve. We don't know how it's going to resolve, what it will be like, you know, in the new normal. And during this time, we're missing out on things or things aren't happening that are significant to us. And it's hard because we just don't know. So the question is this. How do you cope? How do you cope when what you are waiting for is really significant to you and it is not in your control to know when or how it will be resolved? That's when waiting is hardest because we aren't in control and we don't know when or how it will resolve. It's like if you lose your job unexpectedly, and that's significant. And you don't know when you'll get your job back, if you'll get your job back, what your job will be like, what you'll be paid, and your finances are dwindling. And because of that, it's hard. It can almost become debilitating. This is when waiting moves from being emotionally challenging to being debilitating. As the uncertainty goes up, it becomes harder. And so we might be tempted to turn to waiting remedies. And we hope there'll be remedies, but a lot of times they're not. What are some waiting remedies that you turn to to cope when waiting is hard? In a recent article in Gather Magazine that I'm using in part for this sermon, Dr. Joy Schroeder says that when the way we respond often when we are uncertain uh, through the uncertainty of waiting is we just get busy. We just get busy. We stockpile, we prepare, we store up defenses, we start some hobbies, we start new projects in our house, we start exercising more, we work more, we start buying like crazy, all in hopes that this will give us a sense of regaining control. But often it doesn't do that. It's not a remedy that works. Sometimes I think we, in our remedies, we are seeking pleasure to dull the pain of having to wait. And so we turn to our screens more. We turn more for entertainment. Maybe we eat more. Maybe we self-medicate with drugs or alcohol. But it doesn't help really in the remedy. Sometimes... I think we look for someone to blame for having to wait, especially when it's not in our control. There's got to be somebody that's at fault here, so we start assigning evil intention to people, or we, we 
move towards some conspiracy theory in order to blame someone for our waiting. And sometimes we simply latch on to the latest, greatest fad for successful living. The question is, do any of these remedies work? What are the remedies you have tried when waiting gets hard? I hope they've worked. But let's, let's be honest. Let's understand that oftentimes the remedies, the waiting remedies that we turn to do not deliver the goods and instead leave us feeling more emotionally challenged and more debilitated because they don't work. Maybe a good step right now is to think of some of those healing remedies that we turn to and kind of roll them into a confession and be honest with God. So friends, let's take a moment right now to do just as Pastor Steve has mentioned to consider and think about and confess to our Lord before the Lord as he gathers with us right now those healing remedies that have been unhelpful to us. So uh, we're going to enter a time of confession and forgiveness and on your screen there'll be your responses after I uh, lead through as I lead through this confession and forgiveness time. So my friends uh, let's take a moment uh, of silence to prepare our hearts for this moment. This confession is based on Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When I have to wait, I have sometimes become afraid, O oh God, even though I know better. I confess to you that when I am waiting, I sometimes I begin to to doubt that you are with me. When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. O oh my God, when I am waiting for my body to be healed, help me to be confident in your deliverance. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. I believe, Lord, when I am waiting, help me overcome my unbelief. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in my his tent uh, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Forgive all my sins, O God, spoken and unspoken, so that I may shout with joy for my forgiveness and eternal life with you. What you have needed and what you've most waited to hear is now announced to you. Through the work of Jesus, all your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first lesson for today comes from James chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. The words will be on your screen. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. 
you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midday or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of our Lord. It was a Thursday, 40 days after their leader, their amazing teacher, their rabbi had risen from the dead. Proving that he, Jesus, had defeated our greatest enemy as human beings, which is death. And so the disciples of Jesus thought, surely now, now would be the time when what they had most been waiting for would happen, would come about. And so they asked Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, this. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That was a big deal for them, for the Jews at that time. They had long waited for the Messiah to come, who would be a king like David, who would usher in a restoration of the kingdom of Israel like it had been under King David. This was the cry of their heart. More than a political cry, this is a cry to restore the glory that they had once known. This is a cry that has echoed through the centuries in many countries and many empires. When will the glory of Rome be restored? When will it be again that the British Empire will be so vast that the sun doesn't sit, set on the empire. When will America be great again? This is a cry of the heart to be restored to former glory, to be moved into future success. And maybe what you are waiting for in life is like that as well. It's like it's so significant to you but you don't know when or how it'll be resolved, you're waiting. You're not in control of that. And it seems to get harder all the time. And you cry out to the Lord, oh God, oh God, how can I possibly continue to cope with my waiting? We read three Bible lessons today. Two that Aaron's are reading and, and Psalm 27 that we're reading as part of the service today. All three of those lessons teach 
what it means to wait, to wait on the Lord. None of these Bible passages sugarcoat the fact that waiting can sometimes be really hard. Hard to cope with. But all three of these lessons teach this truth. When we learn the spiritual value of waiting for the Lord, our faith grows stronger and our hearts grow in courage. When we learn to wait on the Lord, our faith grows stronger and our hearts grow in courage. Let's just take one of these lessons to learn this from James chapter 5. James, who wrote this letter was the brother of Jesus, the earthly brother of Jesus. James' parents were Joseph and Mary. He was the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. And he became a significant leader in the early church in the days after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. But that had not always been the case for James. James had been a doubter of Jesus throughout the lifetime of Jesus... James did not believe in him. He did not think he was the Messiah. He did not think he was the amazing teacher and miracle worker that everyone else thought. He was a skeptic. He grew up with him. This was his brother. How could he be the Messiah, he thought. And then Jesus appeared to James, his brother raised from the dead. And that changed everything for James. James became a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, and a significant leader in the early church. And so he writes this letter that we have in the New Testament that bears his name, James. It's one of the earliest writings we have in the New Testament, written just 15 years after Jesus rose from the dead, around the year 40 A.D. And James in this letter deals with a number of issues, but in chapter 5, beginning of verse 7, the issue he's addressing was a significant problem for the earliest followers of Jesus. And that was that Jesus seems to have been delayed in returning, in coming back. That the second coming of Jesus was delayed. Because the earliest followers of Jesus thought from what he had said, like we read in Mark 13, that their generation would not pass away until Jesus had returned. And so it was a problem for them that Jesus had not returned. And so in James chapter 5, he is dealing with this issue where the early Christians had really begun to struggle with that. It was a delay, and they were waiting for that. And the truth is, followers of Jesus have always been waiting for this. We've always struggled with the fact that Jesus hasn't returned yet. It could be today. I hope we are all ready, as Jesus said, to watch and be ready. But we all cry out, Lord, when will you come again? When will you make all things new? When will you restore the kingdom of God? We're waiting for that. And whether you believe it or not, as a follower of Jesus, the thing that you are most waiting for is Jesus to return and to make all things new. I think we can learn of the spiritual value of waiting from what James said when he spoke into this issue to the early Christians. James wrote this. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. Now, when you are waiting for something that's really significant, and you don't know when or how it will be resolved, and so it's really difficult, maybe even debilitating, and someone says to you, be patient. Or you say to yourself, be patient. Now that's a right word, it's a necessary word, but it's not always the most comforting word. Because it's a lot easier said than done to be patient. And I think James understood that. 
So then James turns to a familiar illustration to open up the understanding of his readers about what it means to wait on the Lord and the spiritual value of waiting. It's an illustration of a farmer waiting. James writes this. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. Maybe you grew up on a farm. As, as far as I know, we have no one in our congregation right now that's an active farmer. We have people that were farmers. Maybe you grew up on a farm, or maybe you know a farmer. And if you do, you know that there's a lot that we can learn from farmers about waiting and being patient and trusting the Lord. Because every year, they put their seeds in the ground, and they're buried, they can't see them, and they just trust that they're going to grow, and they trust that the rains are going to come at the right time, in the right amount, not too much, not too little, and that crop is going to grow up. And the reason the farmer can wait for that and trust in the Lord and wait on the Lord is because over the years, they've, the farmer has seen that happen over and over and over again. The same is true for us when we are learning to wait on the Lord. When we look back on our lives and see how Jesus has over and over and over again showed up in our lives, restored our lives, protected our lives, healed us, done great things in our lives, changed our lives over and over again, we know that we can wait on the Lord and trust in him. Now, sometimes you might be saying, well, sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes what I'm working, waiting for doesn't happen. Well, it's just like the farmer. Sometimes the rain doesn't come when it needs to or it comes too much. But when the farmer steps back and looks at the whole of his life and the whole of his experience, most all the time, the rains come. And the same is true for us. Mo when we step back and look at the whole of our lives, we can see that most all the time, God shows up, giving us the desires of our heart, restoring what we may have lost, or moving us forward to what we desire, what we're waiting for. We read in Mark 13 today how the apostles including James, heard Jesus' promise that Jesus will gather his chosen ones. That's you, by the way. When you heard that today, chosen ones, you thought, who's Jesus talking about? He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about all those who have put their trust in Jesus. And even if you're today with us and you're not sure you put your trust in Jesus, I want to tell you, God's desire is to choose you. He says, Jesus will gather his chosen ones from all the world, from the farthest ends of the earth to, and heaven. This was a promise that Jesus made. In that same text, we also know that the apostles heard Jesus say this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. There's another promise. And here we are. Nearly 2,000 years later, and we are still rehearsing the words of God, of Jesus. His words are still with us. And over and over again, we rehearse those words and learn from those words and trust those words. And over and over again, Jesus delivers and satisfies our anxious waiting. James and the other disciples of Jesus, apostles of Jesus, knew that they could faithfully wait on the Lord because Jesus rose from the dead. And we also know that we can faithfully wait on the Lord because his promises to us and how he has delivered on those promises over and over again. James then teaches the precious crop of waiting. And he says this, you must also be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. When we learn to wait on the Lord, our faith grows stronger and our courage in our heart deepens. 
That's the precious crop of learning to wait in the Lord. He goes on to say, when we are learning to wait in the Lord in this way, we stop our grumbling. And people begin to call us blessed because they see our trust in the waiting and then we're not grumbling when the waiting goes on and on. By reminding ourselves of the promises of God and rehearsing how God has been faithful in resolving our waiting, showing up in our lives, we learn the spiritual value of waiting. When we learn the spiritual value of waiting for the Lord, our faith grows stronger and we grow in courage. To learn the spiritual value of waiting, we need to regularly rehearse and remind ourselves of the promises of God and how he's fulfilled those promises. That's why it's so important that you continue to come to be with us during this season of Advent as we learn about the spiritual value of waiting. One of the ways that we can learn this value of, of waiting is by praying the words of the Bible. That's what we're going to do right now. There's going to be a prayer that is going to show up on your screen. It is from Psalm 27, verses 7 through 14. And I'm going to pray this prayer, and you are free to pray it with me, either in your hearts or out loud as we go through it. But here's what I want you to do as you are preparing yourself to pray this prayer. Think about that, what you are waiting for, that maybe has become emotionally challenging or even debilitating. Have that in mind as you pray these words, reminding ourselves of the promises of God and his faithfulness in answering those promises and fulfilling those promises. Let's pray together Psalm 27. Let us pray. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And, and let, let your, your heart, heart take, take courage. courage. Wait, Wait for, for the, the Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. So we take a few moments to light our Advent wreath. As Pastor Steve said earlier, if you have an Advent wreath in your own home, you're welcome to light your wreath with us. Uh, but let's take a moment to light the wreath over to my right. Uh, as we continue this Advent season, as we begin an Advent season uh, and our move towards Christmas and that celebration. For hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the Hebrew people prayed these words from Psalm 27 as a way to encourage themselves as they waited for the Messiah to come. Wait for the Lord, they prayed, and let our hearts take courage. Wait for the Lord. For centuries, the prophets and teachers told the people of God to be patient and wait for the Lord. In the fullness of time, Jesus was born, and in his lifetime, faithful Jews came to accurately confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. As we light the first candle on the Advent wreath today, we learn the spiritual value of waiting as we rehearse the promise of Jesus to come again to make all things new. In all your waiting, be patient, therefore, until the coming of the Lord. Let's sing our next song, You'll Come.
All right, my friends, so let us join our voices together wherever we are, uh, confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. This creed has been around for centuries, and Christians have confessed the same creed as our confessing our faith and our assurance in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us confess together. I believe in God, the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven heaven and earth, I believe believe in Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, Son, our Lord. He He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Catholic Church, the the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Let's take a few minutes and pray together as we pray for people here and around the world. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. We pray, Lord, for the ministry we share in Christ's name. Open our hearts to your call for justice, peace, and healing. Attune us to the needs of the world as you draw near. We pray for people who are in crisis as the seasons change. For those without homes facing severe weather. For those in India who have suffered from the flooding after severe cyclones. For those who are unemployed or underemployed, for those in poverty or facing food insecurity. Ease the suffering and support them when they struggle through and through us and the work carried out through Lutheran Social Services and the Gehenna residents in need. We pray for the people in our families and congregations who live with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, addiction, 
or other illnesses. Ease their suffering and support them when they struggle. We pray especially today for Dean and Paul, for Glenn Bryant, Jen Chrysler, Blake Church, for Jan Dixon and Dale Grillo, for Les and Terry Haley, Jeff Jerka, Joanna Mahoney, Kyle Mullenix, Kaylee Orders, Michael Richard, Amy Timmons, and Daniel Wina. We pray, Lord, for the family and friends of Nancy Fisher, the family and friends of Ava Grace Gunn, and the family and friends of Tim Mailing. Lord, draw near to us and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So just a few announcements uh, for our life together. First, there's a connection card uh, online. If you take a moment to fill it out, we'd appreciate that. It helps us know who's gathering with us for worship. And so two categories of announcements. One is the Advent and Christmas season. The Advent season we've just begun and the Christmas season that we're preparing for. Uh, and then about a mailing you received this week. So about Advent and Christmas, uh, there's a waiting together kit that you can purchase online for $5, one per family. And it looks like this. It's an Advent wreath. And uh, you can, it's not too late to pick up one, even though today we started Advent. You can still get one. We have plenty more here at the church. Uh, just donate on $5 online and come pick up your Advent wreath, this wedding on together kit. In that kit, there's Sunday devotionals, very brief reflections and a prayer that you can pray individually or with your family. And on the back of that sheet is a uh, month December calendar of activities for each day that you can share with your family uh, during this Advent season. The angel tree is beginning as well as we help uh, folks in Gehenna with their Christmas celebration. And we're supporting the Gehenna gift shop. Uh, you can go to our website and perch, click on the purchase gifts to be, to be part of that angel tree. You can also make a donation financially. If you write a check and put St. Luke in the memo, we'll, we'll apply that to this angel tree uh, ministry. The deadline for these gifts is December 4th. So it's coming up quickly this next week. Uh, so make sure you take a look at that today or this week on our website uh, around the angel tree. You can also volunteer. And there's information about volunteering also on our website for Angel Tree. Mary Marketplace is coming up next Saturday from 11 until noon. It's on Zoom this year. We were hoping to have it in person, but because of the pandemic, the changes we've had to make as a church, whether we worship, but certainly for Mary Marketplace as well. That's coming up next Sunday. It's a great event for kids and families uh, from birth, kids from birth to fifth grade. It's a chance to uh, create and give gifts uh, as we prepare for our Christmas celebration. Today's the last day to reserve your spot. So go to our website and reserve your spot for Mary Marketplace. And as we prepare for Christmas, we're also selling poinsettias as we always do for, for during the season as we prepare for Christmas. Poinsettias are $7. You can make, you can donate, a, uh, you can, excuse me, you can purchase poinsettia in memory of somebody uh, Orders are due by December 13th. Please uh, purchase a poinsettia as we beautify our worship space, worship space for Christmas Eve. And lastly, the category of mailing. You received a mailing in the, in the mail, a mailing in the mail. You received some letters, a letter in the mail this week uh, with three pages to it. I want to highlight two very brief things from that mailing. First, we have an online uh, congregational meeting, December 6th, next, set, next Sunday, at 11.30, we uh, ask that you plan to attend that meeting. It's an um, important meeting about our church budget as we look ahead into 2021. Uh, instructions about that meeting to access that meeting through Zoom is in that mailing. We're also going to send something out hopefully later this week as well for, with further instructions, but certainly look at that, that letter that you received this week. And also in that letter you received was a... Uh, 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 a paper with instructions about sharing communion online. So we're going to, and we've never done this before, this is why we send these instructions to you, share communion, the Lord's Supper, together virtually. 
And those instructions you received and the frequently asked questions will help you prepare in your home to celebrate Lord's Supper with us. And we're going to do that next Sunday during worship. Make sure you take a look at that. And if you have any questions about that, certainly let us know this week. We look forward to sharing Lord's Supper with you virtually as we can together gather for worship online during this time. All right, my friends, those are the announcements today. Uh, now I ask you to receive the Lord's blessing. Be assured, my friends, that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Amen.
My friends, walk in trust as you wait for the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great week.